Gospel reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 35 and 41 to 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this Jesus? Sorry, I've messed up. It's all right. Start again. Okay. You'd have to do the, the introductory bit, so I'll just edit that in. So you just, okay. just read the, that second bit again. Okay. It doesn't help if you're oh, starting me. Okay. No, no, I'm just saying. Okay. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven. Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Good morning, everyone. A prayer. Lord Jesus, as I speak this morning, may you be here with us, the bread of heaven. Feed and renew us with your word so that we might share in your purpose in giving life to the world. Amen. Amen. Now, last Sunday in Kingsley, the Gospel reading was the verses just preceding those that we've just heard. And they too are all about bread. And Christopher spoke about bread, his love for bread, making it and eating it. And his core message was of the different breads that we can choose to eat. And he challenged us, challenged us to consider what type of bread we wanted to eat. And the reading last week ended with verse 35, which is then also the opening verse of our reading today, when Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So John's gospel is different from the others. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic gospels, as they present similar narratives of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. John's Gospel has a different arrangement and offers a different and a unique perspective on Jesus. Whilst John does include the last meal Jesus has with his disciples, the Passover meal, his Gospel does not retell Jesus giving the bread and the cup and instituting the new covenant. However, the symbols and words used in the Lord's Supper are abundant everywhere or elsewhere in the Gospel of John not least in the verses that we have just had read to us. So John's writing in the Gospel today prepares us for the identification of the bread with Jesus' flesh and about how this flesh is then identified as the bread of life. When Jesus starts to speak of being the bread that came down from heaven, it's interesting how the listening crowd respond to Jesus and what he is talking about. They start to question who Jesus thinks he is this son of Joseph, from a family they know well. Can we empathise with and understand how challenging those words would have been to those that knew Jesus really well? They'd seen him growing up, and yet here he is, 
not just talking about being from heaven, but that he's the son of God. But Jesus does not defend himself against the grumbling and the complaints about him. Instead, he, responds, he returns to the problem of their spiritual receptivity, their openness to hear what God is saying to them. The idea of this man they know, Jesus, being of divine origin and descent, being more than the son of Mary and Joseph, is impossible for those in the crowd to comprehend unless God in some way illuminates it for them, what Jesus calls being drawn by the Father. And Jesus refers to Isaiah, where the prophet saw Jerusalem being rebuilt after the exile and that intimacy with God was re-established. And Jesus explains how God must move in the inner heart of a person before they can see the things of God, that they must be drawn to God. And Jesus also talks about of their ancestors and how they ate manna in the desert, yet they still died. What Jesus is talking about in this passage and its lead up with all these images of bread is to introduce something of far greater significance than the bread that has just fed the 5,000 or even the manna given to the Israelites in the wilderness. Jesus is introducing to them that he is the true bread of life. Twice he states that he is the bread of life and three times refers to himself being the bread that came down from heaven. But then in reference to the new covenant that he establishes at the Last Supper, in the final verse, Jesus says that whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. When we as, as believers partake of the living bread and the living water, Jesus tells us that we will live forever. How can we relate this to this passage and the wider teaching of it in our own lives? I've recently been reading some of John Stott's writings and Stott explains that we must truly partake of the bread of life, that we must embrace it, truly believe it, and then we will never hunger. And when we truly believe, then we will never thirst. Jesus' metaphor is talking of the hunger in all our hearts that only Jesus can satisfy, a thirst only Jesus can quench, when the inner emptiness in our hearts is replaced with a personal fulfilment. And leading on from this, Stott talks of how to be in Christ, of how being in Christ brings family unity, how we can come to belong to God's family, what, Jesus, what Paul calls Jesus' single new humanity. And finally, Stott says, being in Christ brings radical transformation, a transformation that goes to the very roots of our very being, changing the very essence of us. When all this happens, only then can we become the world's salt and light, sharing the good news with others, making an impact on society, and above everything else, seeking to bring honour and glory to the one who deserves it. Now again, referring back to Christopher's talk last week, he spoke of how we can live our lives differently when we really embrace this teaching. He talked of how we can see ourselves and one another as persons created in the image and likeness of God, rather than as obstacles or issues to be overcome. And that we trust the silence of prayer rather than the words of argument. Choose love and forgiveness rather than anger and retribution. We relate with intimacy and vulnerability rather than superficiality and defensiveness. We listen for God's voice rather than our own. Ultimately, we seek life rather than death. Now, this last couple of weeks, there have been some wonderful declarations of faith that athletes at the Olympics have displayed and spoken of. Have you seen those that take off their name tag and turn the back, and on the back is, there is a message, a gospel reading? It's wonderful to see. And one particular example stood out of someone living their life this way at the Olympics. The young British diver, Andrea, Andrea Spendolinix Syriax, who won a bronze medal in the synchronized diving with her partner, Lois Toulson. In her television interview afterwards, she is quoted as giving all the glory to God. But her post on Instagram goes so much further. She opens by quoting Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be, will be with you wherever you go. And she goes on to say God blessed her when he brought the partnership together and that God was with them through all five rounds. He is with us wherever we go. He never lets us down. 
And she closes her post by saying, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's so wonderful to see that wholehearted commitment and acceptance. The cynical among you may say that's easy to do when she's just won a medal. But despite doing really well in the qualifying for the individual event, just after that, in the final, it didn't go quite so well for Andrea. And she was seen in tears after one of the dives when she knew that she could no longer win a medal. But she talked of them not being tears of disappointment or sadness, but because she was so overwhelmed by being surrounded by love. In this young 19-year-old woman and her Olympic experience, we can see that any inner emptiness she may have felt in the diving competition was replaced with her personal fulfillment. She talks of being surrounded by love, regardless of what she has achieved in the competition, through her family unity. And she has clearly been radically transformed by her strong faith and absolute trust in God. She says she knows there is more God has in store for me. So what about us? Do we have that same faith, trust and belief in the words that we've read today? They remind us that without him, we are nothing. But he asks us to come and feed on him. Come, believe and be thankful. Man does not live on bread alone, but by the very word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus is that word. Amen.